Welcome back to another episode of Let's Face the Facts. I'm your host. My name is David Almeida. I'm an actor in Orlando, Florida. And every week I sit down with an actor or artist friend and we watch an episode of the 1980s sitcom The Facts of Life. And then we hit record, talk about the episode and lots of other stuff. And hopefully you listen and enjoy it. This week, my guest is Cameron Francis. Cameron is an actor, a super sweet guy, another one of the many whom I get to work with at multiple theme parks. He is also a very gifted magician, though you would not know that if you listened to this podcast in its entirety, because I completely forgot to bring that up when I interviewed him. Yeah. It was like hours later while I was editing, I suddenly texted him and went, what is wrong with me? I didn't even bring up your magic in that you're a magician and kind of well-known in the magic world. And he was just like, oh, whatever. Anyway, at least I focused on his acting and I had reason to do so because he is a very, very gifted actor. Um, Anyway, as I like to look at it, I, I think it's a better glass half full scenario to say how about when Cameron returns we have something to look forward to yeah we're gonna go with that Cameron and I watched season two episode 16 named uh Brian and Sylvia and that original air date was March 25th 1981 guys this is the last episode of season two we're done I can't believe it Actually, I'm a little sad because I mean, we had so many good shows. Season two was just this amazing gift, this breath of fresh air after suffering through season one. A little part of me didn't want it to end. And then we get this episode. Talk about going out on a whimper. But we're going to talk about that in, in detail as we get on with it. Uh, and thankfully, we know we have many, many more great Facts of Life episodes ahead of us. So... Let's wrap up season two. Let's jump on in. This is me with Cameron Francis. Well, hello, Cameron Francis. Well, hello, David Almeida. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> we're, we're going to talk in our radio voices this oh, entire yes, show. Yes, our soothing radio voices. Yeah. This is Delilah, and we've got a nice shout-out to Jesus on this beautiful (laughs) Christmas Eve. Yes, indeed. Uh, Great to have you here. I'm glad you were able to make the time to come and join me for this. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to be here. I've been uh, uh, wanting to uh, be on for a little while, and boy, what an episode you picked. (laughs) I (laughs) <laughs> this was so, it was so difficult because it's like, this is technically not an episode of the Facts of Life. Yeah. It really isn't. It's, yeah. It, we're talking, we're at the, this is the big, we're at the end of season two, this momentous, amazing season where they course corrected and took a piece of shit and somehow polished a gold doubloon. <laughs> They sp- I'm mixing my metaphors here. They uh-huh. spun the shit straw yeah. into Rumpelstiltskin gold, and then you have this completely not off-brand other backdoor. Oh. It's a backdoor pilot yeah. where we're trying to make another show out of this show that's lightly connected to it. So It, it wasn't just off-brand. It was like off, off, off-brand <laughs> because it was... This was a treat, let me tell you. A treat in the sense of, wow, wow, this did not end up a show. No. And we're okay with that. Yeah, I think we are. Yeah. And I, and the thing is, I'm not, I don't think it's the worst. If it did become a show, it would have gotten better. I don't think it's the worst sitcom that would have come out of the 80s. No, I, many. Yes. I mean, I agree with you yeah. on that point. I think that, yeah, I mean, it probably would have been innocuous and, well... Maybe not so innocuous, but but it would have been okay. Yeah. Uh, I think it would have been incredibly awkward though if it did become a show. I think the the uh, the type of humor, the type of humor, the and humor. the themes. Yeah. yeah, it would have been real awkward. I yeah. think. Okay. Well, before we actually get into the plot, let's let's cover our bases with you. First sure. of all. Uh, did you watch The Facts of Life when you were growing up or as a kid or in reruns? Yes, I did. Um, but that was a long time ago, so it's been a while. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, you, so you watched it first run prime time? First run prime time. At the risk of revealing your age, yeah. which I know is sensitive yeah. for people. <laughs> but yeah, I did. I mean, and I was, I mean, I was fairly young. Yeah, um, you're, you're younger than I am, yes, which is so, most yeah. of my guests um, are. <laughs> and I would imagine, I guess I also watched it in syndication. Was it syndicated? Oh, God. It was, yeah. Oh, God, right? yes, So yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, totally. Um, so yeah. Um, well, uh, cool. So you are familiar with the show show itself, but had you seen this episode, did you remember this at all from the, Oh, if I had seen this episode, I would have remembered. (laughs) (laughs) I did not. (laughs) Well, um, as we are talking in theoreticals here, the first thing I like to start off is I ask my guest, would you please give a one to two sentence quick synopsis of this episode, uh, as what you might see in a TV guide or whatever? Okay, um, Natalie and, and I always want to say Rudy, but it's not Rudy. No, it's Rudy is the Cosby show. Rudy is the Cosby show. Tutti. Tutti. Okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> they go to visit um, Tutti's, is it her aunt? Her, yeah, it's her, her aunt. aunt in Buffalo, mm-hmm. and hilarity ensues when it finds out that she's married to a white guy. What? What? <laughs> and that is the, that's Kind of what happens. I mean, there's other stuff too, but um, yeah, that's sort of the. But that's all there really the main is. Main talking yeah. point. We yeah. are basically Tootie and Natalie step into a different TV show mm. where the the main thesis of the show is it is about a mixed race marriage. Yes, that's really what this show was going to try to be, and it really explores it in such an in depth and and fascinating and meaningful way that actually i'm completely kidding no it doesn't at all (laughs) there's none of that in this show i i know that spike lee must have seen this and been (laughs) inspired when he was a child (laughs) to make films nothing like this. yeah pretty much uh yeah it's it's quite surprising some of the humor here it is clearly of the time Mm. uh this is uh 1981 Mm. that this ran this is and we're in the spring of 81 right now yeah and um i would venture to say it would have been the first TV show with an interracial couple as the main characters. True. That doesn't... Does that exist? Had, did that ever... This is a terrible thing to say. Did that ever happen? Like, immediately my brain is going to Happy Endings, which was like about six adults. Right. And there was... Damon Wayans Jr. was married to... Uh, Eliza Coop. <laughs> Eliza Coop, okay. Yeah. It yeah. was, yeah, it was, I think, by the people who maybe made Scrubs. It, okay. Oh, it was Casey Wilson was on it. And it was okay. one of the, her husband was the um, producer of it and the writer and stuff. Sure. But, so there was a show where one of the main group of characters was an interracial couple. Yeah. Is there a show where the the show is about an interracial couple? I mean, I'm... It's, I would think be. I would know that. What? Yeah, there must be. Like, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not a, a TV maven, so I don't know. I, I wouldn't know. I know yeah. you watch more TV than I do. You, I feel yeah. like you would know better than I would. I, I, I am not aware of that, that this ever was a thing. Yeah. And nowadays, we're kind of past that. It's kind of where I right. think, not, not in our society, but in our entertainment, sure. we are certainly post-racial yes. Yes. and all that stuff. Right. Uh, in terms of the, there is so much more openness to colorblind casting, sure, and all that. But um, now this is not the first time we've seen an interracial couple on television. We had, of course, right. the first kiss was Captain, Captain Kirk. Kirk. Yep, you and know, Uhura, and yeah, yeah, Uhura. Yeah. That was Uhura, the big yeah. thing, and then that was the '60s. Yeah, yeah, and and then we jumped to the '70s, where on the uh, Jeffersons, right? Uh, well, I'm before that. There oh, before was a that. um, there was a variety show. Where, good Lord, I have to find the video and post it, but I can't think of who it is. It was a black male artist and a white female artist who were very famous at the time. Mm -hmm. And they sang a duet and there was a brouhaha whether they were going to broadcast it. Hmm. And it was like, and it was like a peace song. It was like a song like, right? it was, I, I want to say, was it Petula Clark and... I can't remember. I'll look right. it up. I'll figure it out. I'll talk about it in the bumper. But yeah, then in the Jeffersons, the other couple, the Willises, right. were um, an interracial couple. Their daughter, Jenny, was married, was engaged and then later married to Lionel, the Jeffersons, Jeffersons son. Right, right, okay. And, and the show, anytime they walked into that apartment, there were constant zebra jokes. Anytime George could get a zebra... <laughs> 
and it's like <laughs> I've forgotten about that. And and the fact that it was like, oh, wouldn't it be funny if we have the African American guy a reverse racist and uh, making jokes about a black woman who married a white guy? And yeah. I, ugh, uh, yeah, yeah. it's so it's cringeworthy nowadays. Yes, yes. But um, uh, back to this though. This for that reason was ambitious. Yes. But this show would have been also created by Dick Clare and Jenna McMahon, mm-hmm. who created The Facts of Life, which is a spinoff of Different Strokes. Different Strokes, yes. Another show where you're like, this is about sort of racial things. Right. But it's clearly written by white people. Yeah, pretty clearly. Yeah. And yeah. So we'll, we'll get into some of the finer points of this as we proceed, but... That's just kind of your little primer as to what this show was trying to be and what it was trying to do. Um, we begin our show, we be, begin in the parlor with the entire cast of The Facts of Life. And Tootie and Natalie are fumbling trying to find their bus tickets. Right. And in the very quick, short cameo we have of Mrs. Garrett, Blair, and Joe, they comment and the exposition is they're heading up to Buffalo to see Tootie's aunt, we know that, and I, I'm from New England, we say aunt, but sure. sometimes I say aunt because I live in right. Florida. Right. But um, Tootie's, uh, we know that it's Tootie's aunt and her uncle, and, and Natalie is like, yeah, I'm looking forward to meeting the uncle because he's a former Olympic hockey player, and he works at a youth center with a bunch of boys who all yeah. play hockey. So we get full-on boy-crazy Natalie, yes. which is a beautiful thing. Yes. A beautiful thing. So this is a very quick expositional set to say, okay, we're leaving the facts of life and going to another TV show. And I was kind of disappointed that, I mean, I, I'm jumping ahead here, but I was kind of disappointed that Natalie says like, you know, oh, muscles on ice. And she's all excited about these hockey guys. And then there's literally no scenes of hockey in the show whatsoever. No. Like, they, like they set up kind of a joke. You're like, oh, this is going to be something. And it's nothing. There's nothing to do with that later on. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, was there, was there supposed to be a, a, right. a scene there that they, I don't know. It was probably just a, oh, there's a, there's something even remotely connected to boys that we can have Natalie <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, say something about. And that's, that's fine. That's good. Because we just, we fucking love Natalie. Mm. God. Um, so I have to make a comment about the set here. Because mm-hmm. this is the parlor set. It is the parlor set that we see on the Facts of Life. But now, inexplicably, there is a wall and a door in the archway that leads us between the parlor and the cafeteria dining room where uh-huh. Facts of Life primarily takes place. This is clearly one of those where, okay, we have filled this soundstage with the set for the other show. <laughs> we just need this little tiny compressed set for this one little scene, and then we're going to take it away. Right. <laughs> in order to get Mrs. Garrett and Blair and Joe in their environment, we have to create a com- confined area so we're going to yeah. build a door in a wall that has never been there before and will never be there again. That is so interesting. And you know what? It's funny you say that because I didn't think about it at the time, but looking back on it, it did seem like really cramped. Like it did. It was odd to me that they were in this very small frame yeah. for the show, you know, for the opening. And they're all kind of just crammed in there, shoulder to shoulder. Yeah. Two and, on a chair. Yeah. yeah. One's on the chair, one's on the arm of the chair. Yeah. One's on. It's and, so, I never, I didn't think about it until you mentioned that. It's and so when weird. you look at the, particularly, it's the, it's the, uh, Blair and Joe are on the chair, uh-huh. sort of over near where the payphone is. Right. In those shots, if you look, you can see the column where the archway is, where it has a little pediment and architectural detail. Uh-huh. You can see the wall is just a cut, cut out, like there's like an inch between the wall right. and the molding and the little shelfy area. It looks it looks so for this week only. This is not going to last. This is not a finished sure. architectural thing. Sure, it is so completely. Anyway, yeah. just had to point that out because that's sitcoms are so fascinating for how they just change shit and then change it back and think we don't notice and think it doesn't matter. But you, David Almeida, you do notice. It matters. <laughs> it matters a lot, Cameron Francis. <laughs> And to my fours of listeners. So very quickly, then we move over to Brian and Sylvia's apartment. Oh, joy. And it looks like, what do you think this apartment looks like? Do you, do you have any, any reference with whatever shows you watched during the day? Because, I mean, I lived and breathed television in my teen years. 
Yeah, I mean, to, I don't know. It just looks like, to me, it just looked generic sitcom apartment. I didn't really have any other association. What, what, what were you thinking? Um, I am thinking it looked like the love child of One Day at a Time. Oh, yes. And Three's Company. Yeah, like, you know, I actually, that's funny you say that. I, I My first thought was Three's Company. I'm like, that's too obvious. I mean, what else could it be? Yeah. But yeah, Three's Company, absolutely. And I don't even think the couch on Three's Company was striped like that, but somehow no. the couch, I went, that. Is that the same couch on Three's Company? Yeah. I don't think it was because right. Three's Company is ABC. They didn't yeah. share furniture no. and shit. Oh, heavens no. Hell no. no. And as we go on, we'll see. They have they have a full set here. They're they're putting all their chips into the middle of the table here because they spent some oh. money on this living room set as well as a, a spare bedroom yep. that is for Natalie and Tootie. We yep. haven't seen their bedroom yeah. We don't see their bedroom. And then we do also have a kitchen. Yes. It's like, wow, guys. They were like, this thing's going to be a winner. Are you kidding me? This yeah. is going to be the next blockbuster <laughs> on N- NBC, right? This Home is on run. NBC. NBC. Yeah. They were like, oh, this is, this, forget everything else. What is it called? Our pride is showing. Our pride is showing. That was the the, the slogan of the day. Oh, yeah. Um, so we go to their apartment. And um, the, very, uh, the very first thing is we have... Brian, we meet Brian, and then Sylvia comes in later, right? Because she's got the champagne. Yes. So we start with yes, Brian, Brian, and uh, Brian is the wonderful Richard Dean Anderson. Wonderful Richard Dean Anderson. Yes. Yes, the wonderful. We love. We do. We do our Matthew Arder, Jiminy Glick a lot. <laughs> oh <laughs> Where boy. we work, MacGyver himself. Yes, and then later he was on. Is it Stargate, the Stargate series? Stargate, that's right, he was. Yeah, I yeah. didn't watch it, but I know he was on it. Yeah. yeah, did you watch MacGyver? I did. Oh, I loved MacGyver. I, yeah. I never watched MacGyver. Really? That's, I loved that's it. That's a very hetero show. You yeah. got it. Yeah, kind It's of a straight is. guy it show. It pretty much is. I was, yeah. But this is him pre-MacGyver in sitcom comedic actor mode. That's right. And uh, this is, and this isn't that long. It's like only four years or so. I feel mm-hmm. like MacGyver was late 80s. And yeah, like 87. Yeah, that was like that, sort of towards like that. the end. So he's a few years away. Yeah. And, um, but the deal is we, we meet him. He's in a very generic 80s blue jeans and a horizontal striped <laughs> short sleeve shirt. Yep. He's supposed to be a former Olympic hockey player yeah. for for the 76 Olympics, we later learn. Right. So we're five years off, uh, five years past that. Right. Uh, he, he's not in bad shape. No. But he doesn't look, you no. don't look at him and think that's no. an athlete. No, he doesn't have those like hockey player legs yeah. and glutes or anything. You know, he just looks like an average dude. I mean, because what we're looking at here is, okay, I have to be politically correct here. Um, when you look at Caitlyn Jenner, mm-hmm. after she competed in the 76 Olympics and then went on to do movies in the 80s, she, in her former athletic male right. appearing body, right. never lost the bulk in the... Fi- I mean, no. it was... Yeah. Phew, it was... Uh, rent can't stop the music. And and, and he still, uh, you know, coaches or whatever, right? So, like, he's still clearly out there yeah, skating yeah. around and stuff. I mean, maybe he's not as intense as what he used to do, but yeah. he's still, like, getting some exercise. So yeah. you would think I don't, he'd be have a little more bulk on him. Yeah, I don't I don't mean to body shame him, but I'm just no, saying <laughs> he, he looks like he's in perfectly okay, fine shape. He's in fine I'm not shape. sure I see former Olympian yeah, no, athlete. Clearly, no. And, uh, but whatever, that's fine. So he is there, and then in comes Sylvia. Sylvia has just obviously come from some type of a grocery store because she's got a paper sack with her, doesn't she? Yeah, I think so. And uh, Sylvia is played by actress Roseanne, I'm going to say Caton, K-A-T-O-N, maybe Caton, if it might be French, but I'm going to say Roseanne Caton. Now, I don't know if I've seen her before or since. I did do a little research. Uh Uh-huh. She was Playboy, Playmate of the Month in 1976, a few years before. Oh, okay. So she is... That's a real rare thing yeah. to be a former. It's like if you've taken your clothes off, girl. Yeah, especially back then. It's yeah, kind of, yeah, that wasn't a thing where you wow. ever transitioned into, for lack of a better word, legitimate entertainment. Yeah. It, it, so that was unusual. And she's pretty good. She She's pretty good. She's pretty, I would say pretty good is a, an apt yeah. description. Yeah. Pretty she's good. pretty good. Yeah. And here's another thing. Did you ever see Bachelor Party with Tom Hanks? Yes. The uh, original, sure. like one of his first movies. Remember there are two sex workers who are hired and accidentally show up at the bridal shower. Oh. One of them is white. One of them is African-American. And that's her. That's Roseanne Caton. There you go. And 
I remember as even as a teenager, like watching that movie on cable and thinking, she is funny. She's got a really good extra broad smile. Yes. yes. She's really funny. You're making me want to watch Bachelor Party again. Bachelor Party is a great movie. If you like misogyny, homophobia, gender stereotypes. Yes. And, and who things. doesn't? I, it's the, you know, <laughs> mother's milk to me, to my <laughs> entertainment <laughs> appetite. Um, so what happens is Sylvia has come in. She has got a bottle of champagne because she wants to celebrate something. Right. And when you're writing a sitcom, there is no easier way to dispel and disseminate expositional information than to have a toast or a celebration right. or an announcement. So this is kind of, you know, the writers, it's not lazy, but it's a, it is a trope. Oh, where lazy? Perish the thought. I know, Writers really. Aren't lazy. They're... And uh, so she's got champagne. Oh, he kisses her when she comes in. It's like, and doesn't he do something like mm, numbers? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, numbers. N- I think he says numbers. Wow, is that what he said? That's I, a very, oh, that's a man. very 21st century word. Yes. I wouldn't have expected that. That was a little unexpectedly yes. modern for me. Um. So uh, she has this bottle of champagne, and he's like, what are we celebrating? She's like, well, number one, I love you. Number two, we are one month and four days away from our one-year anniversary. And he says, that's right. So that means we've been living together for two years. And there's a little bit of a laugh. Yeah. And there are there are many laughs in this show, some of them even from the audience in the studio. Right. A lot of it, not. A lot of it, you can tell, is sweetened. Canned. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I typically am pretty good at spotting it and defending the earlier shows where people are like, oh, the laugh track. I'm like, I don't think so. This one, I'm pretty sure there was a laugh track to help it along. Because there's supposed to be a joke there. We've lived together for two years. It's supposed to be, oh, they lived together before they were married. Scandalous. Yeah. Big deal in 1981. And, um... Uh, oh god and then we get into the (laughs) well we're so happy we're such a happy interracial couple do you remember the jokes that they made here oh man did you write any of them down the one that oh the one that i just i mean even saying this makes me just cringe and want to curl up into a fetal position is when he says um she says, I'm blushing. And sometimes he, he says something like, well, sometimes it's hard for me to tell or something oh. like that. Oh, my God. Yeah. I, it was supposed to be cutesy and it was just yeah. horrible. And then she said something in response to him like, yeah, nice coming from you, pale face. Pale face. Yeah, something like that. It was like, oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And then they immediately launch into another where he says, well. Uh, I can't believe I was able to snag such a foxy lady. Foxy yes. is foxy is a blackish word you yes. could use to describe a black woman. Hey, foxy Brown. Foxy I mean, Brown. There you go. And she says, "Yeah." She goes, "I never expected to end up with the Great White Hope." Yes. <laughs> and it, the, this conversation is literally, "Wow, we're so happy. You're black. You're yeah, white. Right. Yeah. You're black. Black. You're yeah. white. White." It's just <laughs> basically commenting on their race like, the whole time with that, and and in, in a very. Yeah, there's nothing um, interesting or, or clever going on. It was just... What the fuck? And, and I think what they were trying to do was say like, hey, see, it's fine. And because we're together, it's okay that we make these sort of racial jokes about each other. But like, it's... it's yeah. Like, uh, yeah. No, maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I'm, I'm just... It's not only inappropriate, I think it's inaccurate. I'm yeah. pretty sure that that's not how interracial couples talk to no, each other. No. Um. So we've got that. Then we've got, uh, oh, when I say that uh, Roseanne Caton is a good actress, she's fine. There are three times in the episode where she goes to say something and she is interrupted. And the first is by the doorbell. Second is by the phone. Third time is when they are on the news and she has to go to commercial or mm-hmm. come back from commercial. But in all instances, she's like, well, the th-, and he said, You're, you said three things to celebrate. She's like, right. Well, the third thing is, and she opens up her mouth, clearly not to talk. Right. Just to open up her mouth. So that she can then be interrupted. And then the, the yeah. doorbell rings. And it's yeah. like, oh, girl, you don't need, that's... no. That, that's comedy. Yes. <laughs> is, is it? <laughs> to, to once again quote Matthew Arter. Yeah. Is, is it? it? <laughs> yeah, no, not but, this um, So the doorbell rings and, um, oh, oh, there was also a comment about their parents. Something about, I forget what it was. Something about parents where there's a question of um, parental 
approval. Oh, we'll get yes. to that. We'll oh, get yes. to that even deeper in up. just a minute or so. So we have the doorbell, and again, more attempts for jokes. Brian opens the door and he says, "Mom." Right. But it is an African American woman standing there. So that's funny. That's funny because it's yes. a white guy right. calling a black woman "Mom." Mom. And um, who it is is it is it is of course it's lovely if he does really call her mom. Right. And it is Sylvia's mother, and it is. The wonderful veteran sitcom actress Jeanette Dubois. She was like the best thing on the show, I thought. She, she was, was fucking awesome. Yeah, she was great. She was Didn't fantastic. even have the best material, but, no, she, but sold she sold it. the shit. But she's the veteran. Yeah, she did Good yeah, Times yeah. Uh, for many years. Good Times, I think, ran se- six or seven seasons. Yeah. And, you know, when they started Good Times, she was just the, the Budinsky funny neighbor. Yeah. Little did they know there'd be all the... Um, conflict behind the scenes and then john amos would leave the show and then esther roll would leave the show so there are a couple of seasons where she's the first credit in the opening theme and you're yeah, like she was so it was amazing because i mean she really did rise above the material because she, mm-hmm. she sold it and she was grounded and i believed her unlike pretty much everyone else on the show <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> and and she was good. It was just good casting because she's yes. just she does have a maternal presence about her. We've already Absolutely. discovered that. Absolutely. And um, and in the conversations, we have um, we have her supporting her daughter. Mm-hmm. And uh, there is a joke about um, when they're talking about what they're celebrating with uh-huh. the champagne. She says, "Oh, that's right. It's one month and four days away from your one year anniversary." Yeah. And he says, "Wow, you two must keep in close touch." And she said, "Oh, I'll never forget the wedding day." And he said, yes, yeah, since you were blocking the aisle with a picket sign. Yes. It's like, yeah. what? <laughs> oh, and then, the, and then we get more of those more wonderful, um, inappropriate racial jokes when she's like, something about, you know, about them together. And the mom says something about, well, it's, it's a shock when you're expecting ham hocks, but you get peanut butter and marshmallow sandwich or something. Yeah, along those. exactly <laughs> that. And then, and then she also says, yeah, well, when it comes to my son-in-law, when you're expecting Billy D and you end up with a vanilla hockey puck. Hockey puck, yeah. A vanilla hockey puck. Yeah. It, it, I mean, it, the, the amazing thing is these jokes literally are just cheap jokes. There's yeah. nothing, there, there's nothing about them that's... Um, organic. Organic to, or, yeah. or uh, uh, realistic. They're just literally just cheap shots, you yeah. know, um, which bad. is a shame because I feel like these actors could probably you know, deserve better material and they're stuck with that. And who's to say it couldn't have gotten better if the network had picked it up? Well, true. NBC's ratings were so bad. We we really, we look at it now and go, oh my God, it's terrible. What were they thinking? But it's like NBC was still, their ratings were still in the shitter. That's they right, were, yeah. They were in such bad shape. This show had absolutely as good a chance as anything else which is to go to sad. series that's it's true <laughs> it's so but that's how, just how lousy their track record yeah, it wasn't was. until the 90s that they really picked up right when you had seinfeld and friends and all uh, that or, no 84 84 okay cosby show oh that's right the, the cosby, cosby show I that was nbc of course literally saved, saved the network yeah, it did, not, didn't it? in in 84 that's right that's and right. then shortly after that the next year golden girls Right, and then that powerhouse Saturday Night lineup, which Facts of Life became a part of. Yeah, we had we had Give Me a Break, Golden Girls, or, or yeah, Gil, Give Me a Break, Facts of Life, Golden Girls, and Two Two Seven. It was all oh, female based yeah, shows right. on Saturday night, and notice two of them uh, primarily Caucasian, and two of them primarily African American cast. True. So it was a really Saturday was a big important night in the NBC lineup. And then Cosby, of course, kicked off what would become Mussy Thursday Thursdays, yes. into the 90s with right. Friends and all that. Yeah. yeah. But we are not there yet. Not even <laughs> we close. We are clearly not there <laughs> we yet. so far away from that. Um, so what do we have? To, oh, so the, the, she joins in on the toast. Jeanette, uh, the mother. I, I didn't even catch the mother's name. I was going to call her Jeanette. Sure. And um, she uh, joins in the toast. And it is so clearly apple juice. Yeah. There is not a bubble <laughs> no in bubble one of the thing. damn <laughs> glasses. It is like so clearly uh, prop sitcom champagne. Yes. So clearly yes. like, oh, honey. And, and you know, deep apple colored apple juice. Champagne yeah. is not that dark. Champagne's a very almost see-through yeah. golden, golden, golden color. Yes. And this was very deep, uh, 
apple juice color. Yeah. And for, uh, for just randomly something I want to throw out there is that they are a very comely couple. They are really attractive. They look very. good together. Yeah, and do. I think they have good chemistry. They do. I think those are the things this did have going for it in spite of the scripts and the bad racial jokes. I do. I think that Richard Dean Anderson is like, if you want a guy to save the world using, you know, a gum wrapper and a rubber band and a, <laughs> and and a paper a, clip, a paper yeah. clip <laughs> he's the guy you call. I don't know, the comedic actor thing? Ugh, I don't know. I found him really pushing it and, and not, broad and broad yeah. and oh at one point early on he does something there's a joke where he ended capping it off with excuse me a steve martin reference right there and and bad <laughs> and bad a really bad. bad steve martin reference yeah bad but steve of course martin. that was topical back then in what 1970 81 or 80 oh no oh god that joke <clears throat> had been years before that then um yeah, but, but no, that was eighty one. Still, that was Steve Martin at the height of his. He was, um, yeah. I think stand up. He, he just start, stopped doing stand up right before then. But but he. Um, but anyway, I, I I found yeah, I really, and and I don't know. I don't know that it's just the writing. I feel like it's also a little bit of their acting. The only thing I actually IMDb this just to see. Before this, the only thing he had done was General Hospital. Oh yeah. So you know I he didn't was know a, that. he was soap actor before this. So I think that he hadn't you know his chops weren't quite there yet. Um, yeah. And bear in mind, you are watching us through the filter of this future role that he became famous true. for. True. Absolutely. I really don't have a frame. I never watched MacGyver. So right. He to me is just like oh he looks familiar. Yeah. I know he went on yeah. to do other stuff, but I'm looking at him going yeah he's as good as you know he could have turned out to be as competent a sitcom actor as anyone. Yeah. Yeah. At the time. Because so many back in back in the day, so many shows had to find themselves. It's true. I mean, and, he. I don't know. He's no John Ritter, though. Oh I mean, fuck no! <laughs> oh hell no! You are. <laughs> There's there is no. Mm. We've we've talked about him at length about yeah. how yeah. amazing he is. So um, we have the other. Okay, so there was the third thing. Now that mom's here, I'm Sylvia's. Like I'm going to tell you the great news. Open mouth, ring. It's the phone, and she answers the phone, and she says, "Oh hi, dad." Right. And then she turns to him and says, it's your father. So yeah, it's like, oh, she calls his father dead. dead and he goes, oh, yeah. that's sweet. And then he says, let me, this is such a, of the time. Let me take it in the other room. Yes. So he goes into the other room. Yes. And then we have to wait for him to go, I've got it. Yep. For her to hang up the extension. <laughs> and it's like, oh my God, when was the last time we had to do no, that? Uh, yeah, no one does. I mean, Oh my Lord. Yeah. But did you catch the other joke? When he goes into the other room. Uh, the mother, oh, Jeanette, yes, says does. to says to her, she says, oh, and how is the exalted Grand Dragon? Yeah. Grand do, Dragon? Do you know what that is? Well, was he a K- leader That's of the a KKK, KKK reference. reference. I mean, come on. That's yeah. a KKK I know, reference. I know. I was like, Holy oh, fucking God. shit. What kind of relationship does it, they have with her parents, I mean, his parents? I, I mean, that would have probably oh. been an episode later where they would have said like, Okay, we want Carol O'Connor, but not as liberal. Yeah. <laughs> See, that might have been interesting if they had had, a, you know, I mean, like... Brought him in? Brought him and had Ooh. some actual issues going on, but, you know... But, but what would the issues have been other than, I'm a racist, yeah. I'm a reverse racist, yeah. because you're a racist. You're right. It's like, it wouldn't have been anything. Yeah, it would have yeah. probably just... I'm trying to find death where it's just not there. Yeah, yeah bad, bad jokes. No. But, yeah, we're just going to go on record. I hope... This is the only KKK joke that we have in the entire series of Facts and Life, uh, Facts of Life. I, oh. I hope it is the first, last, and only time I could do with no KKK jokes ever. Yeah. And I think we all could agree on that. Yeah. Um, so then while he's on the phone with his dad, she tells her mother the news that she's yeah. about to break to Brian. And it is that she has been offered a job doing the 6 o'clock news in New York City. Mm -hmm. Currently, we're in Buffalo, where she does the 5 o'clock news. So this is a big step, a big career opportunity for her. And she uh, and the mother is thrilled for her. It's great. And Jeanette, nice little reference, says, oh, you're moving on up, girl. Yeah, there you go. Because for those who don't know, not only did Jeanette Dubois star in Good Times, she is the one who sings the theme song to the Jeffersons. Well, we're moving on up. Wait a minute. Ooh. What? I didn't know that. I just thought it was a Jeffersons reference. I didn't know she sang. That's her. The Think theme. of the voice. Listen to the voice. Think of fish don't fry in the kitchen. Yes. Beans don't burn on the grill. I'm going to stop singing that now. <laughs> but, um, but it's like, yeah, that's Jeanette Dubois singing it. That's Walona from Good Times. Wow. Yeah. Totally. So that's a lovely reference to uh, her 
other, and those are all Norman Lear shows, you realize, right. as is the Facts of Life. So her connection, she's still in the family. Well, that's what I, I just thought because it was Norman Lear, it was like, oh, that's just a little reference, and hey, that's not fun. No, there's direct connection. Wow. She is the voice that sings. We're moving on up. Interesting. Um, so then he gets off the phone, and then she's like, well, I've got to go because you two have things to discuss because right. there was a question of whether Brian's going to be happy about this news. Right. And then she has her exit line. Well, I just want to say, if you ever do have a disagreement, never go to bed mad. Just go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the audience is all like, ooh, ooh. the mom talking about S-E-X. Mm. Scandalous. So... She says, finally, we get to the moment where Sylvia is able to break the big news. She says, I've been offered the six o'clock news. Oh, my God, that's great. Um, she's like, well, uh, before I say yes, you haven't said yes yet. You have to do it right now. Pick up the phone. All right, I'll do it. And she picks up the phone and she says, it's in New York City. And he says, put down the phone. Oh, yeah, yeah. And just as they're about to continue to talk about it, it's Tootie and Natalie. Right. Who must have passed Jeanette Dubois in the hallway. Yes. So if Jeanette Dubois is Sylvia's mother, that would make her Tootie's great aunt. Right. Why wouldn't she have stuck around and said, I want to say hi to Tootie. I haven't seen her in forever. Yeah. Wow. Unless, this, yeah. I'm just saying, you know, people leave, people come, people go, and they don't see each other. Just a thought. But whatever. That's the least of our problems with this. Oh, yes. Tootie and Natalie appear in the hallway and through the door overhear them fighting about this whole thing of right. wanting to move away. And he is not responding well to this. No. He's being kind of an asshole. He is. I, And this is part of my problem with the show. I, Because his whole thing is he works at the youth center with the kids and it's important and the Buffalo. I get that. Yeah. And he's like, I love it when he says to her, he's like, but why would you want to move to New York City? You're a star here in Buffalo. Yeah. Like, <laughs> who? Like, yeah. The logic there to me was like, that's a big disconnect there. Why wouldn't she want to go to New York yeah. City where she could have more exposure and possibly get a national, you know, uh, uh, anchoring job or whatever. Yeah. But instead he's like, no, we should stay in Buffalo. Like, yeah. what? Like, to me, and I thought, okay, is this show going to be about they're in New York City and he's mad about it? But then later on we found out something different. But yeah. I, I, I did think to myself, yeah. so is this show about them deciding to move to New York? Then why do we have all these sets? Well, that I literally, I thought yes, to myself, true, true. I think this is going to land that they don't move, that they that this is going to take place in Buffalo in these, because they wouldn't have spent that much money on the sets just to have the show picked up and then have to create a whole right. new apartment and all that. Unless but, they just took the set they had and just put the plants in different places and rearranged <laughs> the furniture and made that the New York apartment. They did it with the girls' <laughs> bedroom in season one. Yeah. Oh, well, they did. Absolutely. Same. And they're, they are experts. Wow, we had no idea <laughs> yeah. that was the same set when they swapped two sombreros yes. <laughs> on the wall. Oh, the sombreros. But, um, but his reaction is even, uh, you instigated this. You, you set out to, like, right. like, you made this happen. And yeah. it's like, dude, I am not well-versed in the world of network news. Yeah. But the idea is that if you are a journalist and you're on television... You move around. You right. change. You go from market to market, and your idea is you want to ascend that. Right. It's like Oprah Winfrey is from Mississippi, I think. I think so, yeah. But Oprah ended up in... She mm, was in Baltimore for a while. Baltimore in Maryland, yeah. and then she got a job that brought her to Chicago, Chicago. and that's where her yeah. show launched and stuff. But it's like that's... That is a common journey. You are yeah. not a, a TV journalist with aspirations if there's not automatically the sense that someday I'm going to be changing markets. Yeah. And, and so that, that that's not built into their relationship and her career is problematic for me. Yeah. And, and the other thing that's interesting is that she brings up a point later, Sylvia brings up a point later on that I thought from the get-go, which was, don't they have, you work at a youth center. They got lots of youth centers in New York City, yeah. man. You can help kids there too. And she finally says it. I'm like, exactly. Like, what do you? What? What is this? Yeah. You and know, he does come around to that later. Spoilers. Yeah. yeah he does. But um, yeah, <laughs> massive spoilers there. But no. And but isn't it? Is it here or is it later where she says? What you work with juvenile delinquents? Where right. can you find more, more juvenile, juvenile delinquents, delinquents in New York City? Exactly. And he yeah. still isn't having it. Yeah. So he's mad. Um, but then Tootie and Natalie have to come inside and knock on the door and they're like, eh, hi. Yeah. So then we have this little sidebar where they come in. Hi, Aunt Sylvia. Good to see you. And this is Uncle Brian. And Natalie is like, who? 
Yep. And it's like, what? Di- what? Um, so to sort of move things along, they're, they bring Tootie, she brings Tootie and Natalie, they, they say, hello, pleasantries, bring Tootie and Natalie into the room there where they're staying. Mm. Am I right? There's one twin bed in this room. I think there was. I think there was one twin bed in the room. Odd. Uh, Very odd. I don't know who, if they thought they were going (laughs) to share it. It's like, they're not children. Yeah. It's like, on the show, Tootie is 13 and Natalie is 14. It's like, that's weird. But we're not going to go there because we never see them in bed. But they do say, um, but Sylvia does say, how would you like to come down and see come to my work, see me work at the station. I'm going to be doing the news tonight. Mm-hmm. And they were like, great, it's exciting. And one of the jokes that actually did not get a good reaction was Natalie says, oh, I'm dying to see what a laugh track looks like. <laughs> did a you laugh catch track that? looks like, I did not catch that. And that is I'm great. like, okay. It, but I guess people didn't kind of laugh at it because they were just kind of like, huh, huh, uh-huh. huh. how do you, how do you not know what a laugh track looks like? We've been right. listening to it the entire yeah. time. Yeah. But and it also, was just a weird joke that did not so land what it looks like yeah like, like the joke is odd. she thinks it's it's a physical thing a track physical th- yeah mm, that's yeah. just that's odd that's weird that was an doesn't, odd joke did not work land. so as soon as sylvia shuts the door natalie runs over grabs tootie pulls her in the bed and says why did you not tell me and tootie's like tell you what she said you didn't say anything about it being a mixed marriage and tootie says it's not a mixed marriage he isn't jewish Oh my god! And, that was uh, hilarious. That's kind of, that's, I think that's funny. That was that one of the was best jokes. Really, that was funny actually. Uh, but the thing is, Tootie's kind of like, oh, it's not a thing. It's kind of good. Where Tootie says, oh, I didn't mention it because it was a big deal to the family when they first started seeing each other. But by this time, they've been together a while, and we just—he's just Uncle Brian. We don't think right. about it as being a, a racial thing. And that was like, good, bravo. Yeah, that was great. That was, yeah, I, yeah, her reaction was awesome. Yeah. And, and Natalie's response was like, oh, I mean, yeah, and it is fine. I just, and Natalie even says, I'm a progressive liberal and yeah, all that. Yeah, so she she's does, like, I'm yeah. totally cool with it. But then we hear them shouting in the other room. Right. They're not even trying to hide it from their house guests. Bad hosts. Um, and then Natalie says, Rude. oh, I'm sure it's fine. That's just the way married couples talk. And Tootie says, yeah. Before they break up, slow fade. Mm-hmm. So then we're at commercial. Commercial is always the time I like to get to know my guests a little bit better. Oh, okay. So let's take a little bit of a McDonald's tour through your life and your career, Cameron mm. Francis. Uh, you and I know each other through uh, the the theme park world. Yes. You and I are both very good friends with Citizens of Hollywood. Yes. We both have been good friends with the... Uh, uh, the Hollywood film crew, mm-hmm. uh, the horror makeup. Yes. And uh, Sarge. And Oh, that's right. We're also very good friends. Very good uh, friends with Sarge. With Sarge yes. from Toy Story. Yes. Yeah, we have kind of parallel careers here. Yes. And um, so with that, I, let me do a little James Liptoning, if you'll allow me. Oh, I'd love it. Where were you born? Mm, I was <laughs> born in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania. And I'm not going to tell you what year, but I was okay. born in, <laughs> yep. which is outside of Philly. 1947. Mm, yeah, close. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so that's where I was born. I moved around a lot as a kid because my dad was in sales. So we tended to move. We moved to, we were in Long Island. We were in Michigan, Maryland, back to Pennsylvania. Then I was in D.C. for a while, then New York, and then finally in Florida. So I've sort of just been all over the place. Are your parents in Florida now? No, my parents are not. I am. Uh, my parents are back in Maryland. They're uh, near, the, near Columbia, Maryland. Columbia, Maryland. Okay, so yeah. that's where they've settled. They, that's where they finally settled, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now, um, where did you study acting and performance? So, uh, I went, um, I did, uh, in elementary school, school I got interested um, and I wound up going to the Baltimore School for the Arts, which mm-hmm. is a high school in downtown Baltimore, which was a great experience. Oh, so like a performing arts performing high school. Performing arts high school. So it was half your day, academics, half your day, your discipline. They had oh, music, art, dance, you know, all that oh, stuff. Those theater. are so valuable. Yeah, it was amazing. For the right kids, yeah. Um, and then I went to college, got my, you know, BA in theater, and then I got a master's in acting from Catholic And where'd University. you go to college? College was Westchester University in Westchester, Pennsylvania, where a oh. lot of my family lives there. A lot of my extended family lives there. Cool. And then I went down to D.C. to go to Catholic University for grad school. 
Uh, and then... Uh, and did you get your graduate degree? I did. I have a master's. Yes, I do. M- MFA? MFA. In, in acting? acting? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it shows. Because yeah. when oh. I have seen you doing... Um, I joke about the legitimate theater versus the theme park work. That, does that therefore make theme park work illegitimate theater? And yeah, it yeah, is definitely yeah. not. But um, you are you came to us already uh, a, an established equity actor right. already in the union. You already right. had a lot of leading work and you've done a lot of classics and Shakespeare sure, and sure, stuff. Sure, sure, yeah. So, um, and it is interesting how that really does show when I've seen you in other Sure. performances and other roles and stuff it's yeah. like you it's like one of those oh cameron's a real actor he, <laughs> he can do, he's not just doing this wackety schmackety uh, stuff or putting on a dress like i am half the time uh and all that that's um it's always i've always found you very impressive in in the roles i've seen you well, outside you. on the on the stage stage thank you although i have put on dresses in in what uh, really i did uh tuna christmas uh, did you, you know, when, gra- you know, greater tune of the tune. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I did that at the Hippodrome. I did it twice. But the great thing about that show is that, you know, it's two actors on stage and they each play, we each play like five characters, yeah. lots of quick changes, men, women. So we're throwing on dresses, putting on yeah. lipstick, wiping it off. It's really a lot of fun. Oh, totally. Um, yeah, yeah. So yes, I have worn dresses before wow. on stage. Wow. Good to know. <laughs> Absolutely. And then, um, what brought you to Florida? Florida, uh, the Hippodrome did originally. I mean, I was just coming down here to do uh, theater there before. And And where were you living at the time? At the time, um, well, let's see. First time I was living in D.C., and then I came back, moved to New York, and then I came down again from New York to work there again. And then I wound up meeting um, uh, the woman who became my wife. Mm -hmm. And so I stayed thinking I was going to go back to, we were going to go back to New York, but because of life circumstances, we didn't. Mm -hmm. So I was in Gainesville for a while. And then, but working here in Orlando, doing a lot of commercial work and the occasional yeah. film when I can get it. And then finally moved to Orlando about six years ago. I actually moved to yeah. Orlando. Okay. So there we go. That's my story. Interesting. So uh, now we're going to come back from commercial. And the argument between the two of them is still in progress. Yes. And this is where, Brian, this is where you were talking about. Brian is like, come on. Why would you want to go to New York? You're doing great. You're yeah. famous here in yeah, Buffalo. In Buffalo. <laughs> People see you on the street and they're like, she's even prettier in person. Why would you want to give that up? Oh, I don't know. Because, and, yeah. And she said, I want to do more. I exactly. have bigger career aspirations. As my husband, you should probably know that. Um, and she says, I want to do Jane Polly's job. Yes. I believe Jane Polly at the time was the co-host of the Today Show. I with believe so. Brian Gumbo. Which would make sense because that's an NBC show. So of course uh, they want to reference course. another NBC show. And then he says to her, well, why don't you throw in Barbara Walters on top of that? Yeah. And they're all like, ha, 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 ha. And I forget if she was, I think she was still NBC too. Maybe. With Harry. She was doing the evening news with Harry Reasoner. That was a big thing. In the that was late seventies. Yeah, that was a big deal. Yeah, because right? she was yeah. Yeah, and, and they female. treated her horribly. Oh yeah, they were terrible. She talked to her. about that how they were just shits, man. Like, wow. <laughs> uh. And then this is where the thing about the New York delinquents is more delinquents in New York, and he could work with them. Um, and she says, uh, "We need to support each other." And she says, "Don't you understand it? This is my Olympics." And it's like, oh, nice. Yeah. As in, you've kind of already had your glory. Yeah. And this might be my time. Yeah. Even though they technically weren't together. But it comes down to they're all supporting each other, la, la, la. And he's like, oh, but, you know, I'm doing such great things at the center. I can't let those kids down. It's like, come the fuck on. Really? <laughs> really, dude? <laughs> and then Natalie and Tootie come out and they're like, hey, you told us to be ready to go to the news in 10 minutes and it's been more than 10 minutes convenient way to say stop fighting while we're here yeah and And natalie makes that brilliant otherwise you'd be doing the 527 news (laughs) some of those jokes i i I miss the days when in sitcoms when you they didn't they didn't really have to they didn't really have to have jokes like they could just be a sassy character doing something slightly sassy and they just huge laugh yeah you know when when it's character-based humor versus humor for humor's sake or jokes for jokes sake yeah 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 yeah, and that's why this show is doing so well in this season right but yeah and natalie does this is one of those where natalie actually laughs at herself yeah we've had issues with her you can see the actress who is the least experienced (laughs) of all of them in earlier episodes struggling to not laugh and often failing yes but in this one it was full on <laughs> mm. yeah 
That was actually a great moment. Right yeah, there. no, she she crushed yeah. it. She is really good at that. So then we come to the TV station. And what a great opportunity to meet another character who would be a part of this amazing landmark sitcom that's going to change the face of television. My favorite character in the show, actually. the uh... Ray, the station manager. I, I loved him. I don't know how you felt. I loved Ray. I thought he was wonderful. <laughs> you didn't like Ray at all. I loved Ray. I loved... He's this into neurotic, it. just... Oh, yeah. I mean, at least, he was, at least he was a strong character, but he was playing... Um, I forget. He sounded like somebody, and I can't think of what it is. He was almost doing uh, a full-on New York City Jewish right. hypochondriac character, like a Woody I, totally, Allen. Totally, totally. Like in a, Buffalo, though. In but, Buffalo, though. He's but like, who cares? It was great. And she's like, he comes out. He's like, oh, there she is. What no. have you come to? You come to turn the knife in my oh. back that you've already stabbed me with? Oh, it's like a fishing hook. Take it out of my back. Like I loved. I mean, <laughs> see, I know you might not have liked it. I that was to me was the highlight of the whole show because at least it was interesting and colorful and something yeah. to to break the monotony of this, you know, sort of milk toast humor yeah but I, I feel like this would wear thin after a while i the, mean i'm sure it would but the, the guilt trip laying the station episode. i don't know it yeah. didn't it was fine for me i didn't love it i didn't right. hate it uh but she's like it's nothing personal obviously it's a fucking job in the news industry and yeah. you more than anybody should understand i have a chance to move into a bigger market but um he's like no it's fine <laughs> local woman assassinate station manager film at 11 no. <laughs> It was totally that. I love. Yes. Oh, um, I couldn't get enough of him. <laughs> and then, oh, so then uh, Brian shows up. Oh, we, I'm sorry, we we missed a plot point earlier where uh, when she says, "Girls, come on down to the station and watch me do the news," because it just so happens your uncle Brian is going to be coming onto the news, and I'm going to be interviewing him. Right. So that's right. So Brian arrives at the station on set. He arrives on set, right. and she looks at him and she says, "Look, Brian." Open mouth. All right, we're about ready to go live. And it's like, yeah. So she has to do it. And then it's like, you're watching the five o'clock news with Sylvia Parker. Let's pause for a moment and talk about the news set where it is literally a desk yeah. and a curtain with a clock on it. Yeah. Yeah. They, boy, they really went on. Was it a clock or was it a logo? One. Uh, it actually it might have been the logo. I think it was a logo. I can't remember now, but yes. But, but the, it, it was a logo. But the fact is, it was a curtain. Yeah. Who does a news in front of a curtain? They, they blew all their budget on the fancy apartment. On the so kitchen. They basically had to be like, let's throw up a curtain and use the control room up there for the kids to sit. I mean, there was no, there was nothing to it. It was yeah, the, and, and an that's right. Two D and Natalie do go to the control yeah. room, and it's a real control which room, which is probably just the control room for the show. Fucking a, <laughs> of course it was. You know, it was the act. They didn't build a damn control room no. when they had. They went on location for yeah, that shit. Yeah. Um, so just as they're about to do it, to, to have a little more of a conversation, well, we're on live on the air now. So she says, I've got a man from the Buffalo Youth Center. His name is Brian Parker. He was a, on the 76 U.S. Olympic hockey team, and now he's getting kids off the streets and onto the ice. And um, she's like, you... And she says, he happens to be my husband. So when she's interviewing him, talking about the work with kids, he says, yeah, I do really enjoy the work I do. And, you know, whoever takes my place is always also going to have to be very right. good about that. Right. What do you mean, whoever takes your place? I'm going to move to New York. I'm going to be moving to New York. Cut to Ray off camera. What are they doing? Yes, yes. And then they start in with kind of a, but you said you didn't want to move. Well, what about you? I realized that... You know, if it's not right for me to be holding you back, what is happening? Go to commercial. And Ray is having a conniption off camera. Oh, he's apoplectic. I love it. <laughs> so um, there's a back and forth where he just basically says, no, this is your big chance and I don't want to hold you back. And she's like, but what about you? And she says, no, I'm not leaving. You wouldn't be happy. Other jobs are going to happen. We will both move when it's right for both of us. I don't want you to be, I can't be happy if you are miserable. If it isn't right for both of us, it just isn't right. Mm -hmm. And you're all, oh. And uh, so then that's where you're like, okay, good. They're going to keep the sets and they don't have to burn them or redecorate them to be New York. Right. And then the last thing is 
uh, and they kiss on camera and an interracial kiss is, Ooh. I don't know if that's a big deal or whatever, but they do make a big deal of them kissing at the yes. end. And then, um, we go back to the control booth and Natalie and Tootie says, Oh, I love happy endings. And Natalie says, yeah, you rarely get those on a news show. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> My favorite Reagan. part of that shot was you see Natalie is in the, and, and two of you are back there. And then in the foreground, you just see hunched over. That's the beleaguered, you know, uh, uh, te- technical te- director. Te- just sitting there like shaking his head, looking like, you know, like he just, like he's got a migraine coming on. He's looking <laughs> miserable. Just like looking back at them. I'm like, oh, what the hell are you two doing here? Get the hell out of my booth. I love that. For some reason, that shot just made me smile. I don't uh, know why. Yes. I love it. Very it. funny. Do you watch The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel? Of course. When, when Alex Borstein, when Susie, when she's on TV and keep, Susie keeps going into the control room, oh, yes. and every time she walks in, just this chorus so, of, what the fuck, get out of Close the door, get out I love that. You don't belong in the You don't belong out of here. Oh my God, that was <laughs> And great. she's just like, so hey guys, we're wondering if we could get a close-up shot. And <laughs> she is just completely un. Uh, she yeah. is undaunted uh, by no, she care. when she walks in. There's just this love it. venom love flown it. in her. I love that. That's such a good show. Such a good show. Um, and that brings us to the end yeah. of this episode. Oh, I forgot earlier. Typically at the end of the interview segment, before we come back from commercial, I do ask my guest, do you have a commercial from your childhood or from a bygone era or something you associate with the facts of life? Just Just for complete nostalgia purposes, Throw out a commercial from your childhood, completely random. I, I, you know, I don't know if it, it probably ran during the facts of life. It would make sense, but the the Nair commercial. In fact, I was singing it yesterday. Who wears Wear short shorts? shorts. We you were. I remember shorts. hearing you yeah. talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I just remember that commercial, and it was probably from around the same period. So I'll put it okay. on the actual website. I always wow. like to share those. Sure, sure. Uh, types of things. But this brings us to not just the end of this episode, Cameron. You have the distinct privilege of closing out the season, season two of The Facts of Life. Wow. Well, first of all, I just want to say um, that, um, just to to muse about the show for a moment. Please uh, do. You know, awkward racial humor, uh, uh, (laughs) bad performances, clunky writing, why wasn't this show picked up? I mean, it was just, (laughs) what, what prevented it? And it probably could have had some message and succeeded and it also could have been horrible and over humorized right. and failed. Right. Or they could have been like a bedroom farce because Ray and Sylvia wind up hooking up. <gasps> and then they get, oh, oh no, my yeah. clothes, oh, where no. are they? Sylvia, I, I got to get away. Where's the window? <laughs> I slept with a black oh, woman. Am I going to catch oh, no. black <laughs> from her? Can, can you catch black? <laughs> that, that totally would have been a line. I just wanted, you know what? Ray should have had his own show. I wanted to see that you, show. The Ray, sh- Ray is living <laughs> in a little shoebox apartment by himself, eating ramen noodles every night. Uh, you know, just <laughs> miserable and alone. He's, a hype, he's constantly going to the doctor's office and, oh, my back is killing me. I need some pills. My spilkus and my, my galactic is <laughs> And then I have a Jewish mother character <laughs> and have her coming and saying, when are you going to do so? It, when yes. You, what are you going to do with your life, Ray? Yeah. yeah. When are you going to get married, Ray? It wouldn't, it wouldn't have been a horrible stereotype. No, not at all. It would not no. have been a horrible st- no, no, absolutely not. It would have been not. a vast improvement. It would have been much better. <laughs> So, Cameron, thank you so much for doing this. Thank I'm, you. I, I feel bad it took me this long because so many of our mutual friends have been on the show, and I've heard word that you're like, I want to do David's show. I did. I want to do David's show. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. I got this back pain, but after Oy. I go to my chiropractor. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, thank you for having me. This has been absolutely delightful, and what an interesting, great episode to watch. Um, I'm glad that you find it that way yeah. and that you didn't come in here going, well, what the fuck, man? I didn't get any Mrs. Garrett. No, because this this is this is cooler because like it's this strange, weird, you know, sort of pilot thing that never took off, which to me is much more fascinating. Yeah, oh, and dealing uh, with the regular uh, show. Yeah, yeah. And before we go, we didn't really get any Mrs. Garrett. Do you do a Mrs. Garrett impression? Do I do a Mrs. Garrett impression? There it is. There you go. Something like that. Yeah. (laughs) I I was trying to. I was trying to remember what she sounded like. Once again, your classical acting training. I know has not betrayed you everyone is welcome to do their bad mrs garrett impression oh, yeah. as i do mine i typically do mine every week yeah and we didn't really get any mrs garrett this week we just got a at the very very, very beginning little tag so yeah 
Um, she was brilliant, though. I do love her, Mrs. Gary. Uh, or Charlotte Ray, right? Charlotte Ray. Charlotte Ray, Ray was brilliant. wonderful, yes. Brilliant. She's wonderful. So, Cameron, do yes. come back and do this again. I hope love we get to, to. to do it again. And you'll get a real, I'll make sure you get a real Blair, Joe, Duty, Natalie, Mrs. Garrett episode. Oh, cool. That'll be fun. That will happen. All right. But until then, we'll see you soon. Bye. All right. Bye now. And there you have it. That was Cameron Francis. If you want to learn more about him and his work, he has three websites, actually. He's got CameronFrancisActor.com for his acting, CameronFrancisVoice.com for his voiceover work, and CameronFrancisMagic.com for, you guessed it, his magic. Check it out, because you're going to see he's got merch and uh, products that are magic tricks and effects that he actually invented and he sells. It's really cool, and... You're, you're going to say, wow, and gee, David, really? You kind of forgot to bring it up in the interview, huh? Nice. Good good job there. Bravo. <laughs> Anyhow, not a great note to end season two on beating myself up for this, so let's just move on. I will just plan to talk about it at length when I have him back on the show. So glass half full, people. This is something that we have to look forward to. Now, while I was editing the show, there is something I caught. I'm, I'm aware that I kept saying interracial, interracial, when the specific of what I was talking about was interracial, African-American, and Caucasian. Interracial. Obviously, there are other interracial couples on TV. I mean, technically, I Love Lucy was an interracial couple because you have a, a white woman and a Latino man and all that. So anyway... It's that lovely minefield of what words you pick and choose and what your intent is and being a white person who half the time doesn't even know what the fuck he's talking about anyway. So let's let's just maybe move on from this, but hopefully my what I meant was very clear. I did actually look it up, and it looks like there was a, uh, a show that was on Fox called True Colors that ran from 1990 to 1992. And that was about an interracial family, African-American dad, Caucasian mom, and um, biracial kids. And, and the grandmother in that show was played by Nancy Walker. She of Can't Stop the Music fame, relating to our earlier talk about Caitlyn Jenner in that other minefield of talking about trans people and making sure you use the right gender pronouns. I think we got through it, and I think we got through this episode okay pretty unscathed, and I hope no one was insulted inadvertently. Good God, you know that's not ever what I would want to have happen. Anyhow, let's move on. Uh, the other thing I talked about was that uh, moment on the Variety Show. It was Petula Clark, and it was her show, and the man she sang with was Harry Belafonte, and it was a song, On the Path of Glory, which she actually wrote, and I guess at one point she just took his arm it's not like they were making out. It's not like they were really interacting. It's like, um, I'm going to find a video of it if I can and post it in the website, but it's like uh, she took his arm and it was 1968. People were freaking the fuck out. And I'm, I'm just glad to live in a time where most people, I hope, hear about that and say, really? But anyhow... We won't dig too deep because we know there are still people who have a problem with that. And that's, I have a problem that they have a problem with that. We could talk about that forever. And I need to wrap this up. Um, the other thing is, um, I mentioned that Jeanette Dubois, her character is Tootie's aunt. Did they not cross in the hallway? Did she not say hello to her? Um, let's reanalyze this, people. If Sylvia is Tootie's aunt and... Therefore, as an aunt, she would be the sibling of one of Tootie's parents, either her mother or her father. Then the mother of Tootie's aunt would also be the mother of one of her parents. Jeanette Dubois is Tootie's grandmother. Didn't stick around to say hi, assuming she knew the kids were coming. It's like, really, Grandma? Wow. Okay. Moving on. And then the sad... Sad final note. Let's let's end this season not just on a lousy show, but on a big stone cold bummer. We later find out in an, a Facts of Life episode, season five, episode fifteen, called "Crossing the Line." This is a uh, Edna's Edibles episode, but in the course of the plot of it, Tootie mentions 
that her family wasn't thrilled when her aunt married a white man and they cheered when they divorced. It's like, ooh, really? So we basically get word that um, Brian and Sylvia, by season five, middle of season five, they are not together anymore. So there you go. That's the final depressing, sad ending <laughs> for this season. Jesus. Oh, my. Anyway, moving on. Next week, I'm going to be watching season three, episode one, called Growing Pains. Thankfully, it is not a terrible backdoor pilot. And even more thankfully, it is not the Alan Thick Kirk Cameron sitcom that I never watched, but I know I wouldn't like. And since it is a season premiere, you know what that means. Matthew Arder will be back. Woohoo! Yes, I'm excited. I can't wait. Anyway, um, before I sign off completely and sort of wrap up this season, I don't know why I'm kind of trying to make a big deal about it because it's going to be just another show next week. But um, I just want to say thank you to all you guys who reviewed the show, everyone who's following on social media. It really means a lot to me to read your comments, those who have put posts up, who have written me privately and told me what you thought of the show. I really, really do appreciate that. As of this point, I've got nearly 300 followers from all of the different social media platforms. At the moment, the show on Apple Podcasts has a five-star rating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Based on 16 reviews, including one from my nephew, and the review simply states, that's my uncle. Thank you, nephew. I really appreciate that. Anyway, just sending an extra shout out to all of you who have been so supportive of the show, to uh, my friends who listen, my cousins up north who have told me they're listening. It's It blows my mind to know that there are people actually paying attention to this because I really sometimes just feel like I'm doing this in a vacuum. And thankfully, I love it so much. It doesn't really matter if I am doing it in a vacuum. I'm, I'm really, really happy whenever I'm doing it. So on to our filthy business. Check out the website, facethefactspod.com. That's where you're going to find extra pictures, videos, and audio extras from the digital cutting room floor, links to social media, links to your favorite podcatchers so that you can subscribe. And while you're there, you can rate it. And while you're there, you can review it. Yay! Thank you so much for listening to this week's show. And remember, the facts of life are all about you. you.